2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. The wonder that God loved us. That actually has to do with the sermon today. I think almost every sermon really does. The wonder that he loved us. But we'll start in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now, I'm going to read another one. It has to do with the same topic. It's John 17, 5. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want. It says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The glory which I had with thee before the world was. Today, I'd like to talk about the condescension of Christ. Condescension. Now, that's a big word. It's a theological word. So I'll define it real quick here to clarify what the condescension of Christ is. It's the act of condescending. That probably doesn't help much because it's the same word. Voluntary descent from one's rank or dignity. It's courtesy towards inferiors. The act of voluntarily stooping or inclining to an equality with an inferior, a waiving of claims due to one's rank or position. Basically, think of it this way. And this is this falls short. But it's royalty, say a king, stepping down to serve a peasant. And that doesn't entail it, because we're talking uh, about God, the Son of God, stepping down from indescribable glory in heaven, from eternity before, to step into a human body and die for his enemies. So the, the king stepping down to serve a peasant really doesn't entail it, but The condescension of Christ is that he humbled himself and became a servant and came to die for us. And this is a topic uh, I heard just recently, the the thought that we need to remember. Christians often forget. We pass over things. We'll talk about things, but we forget the depths of those truths. And it's good to remind ourselves of those, have various Christians remind ourselves of those. So I'd like to talk about the condescension of Christ how he stepped down to die for us. And with this is the incarnation, another big term, but it's when Christ took human form. He took a human body. It's to make flesh. Uh, The meaning of it, take up physical form to clothe with flesh. And the verse that talks about that specifically, many verses, but John 1.14, and the word was made flesh. Who's the word? The word is Jesus Christ. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus. So, Philippians 2, 5 and 6. This talks about uh, Jesus humbling himself. And you can turn there if you want. This is a, a big passage we're going we're gonna to focus on a little bit more. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 8. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And there's, there's three phrases in there that really speak to it. In verse 7 it says, made himself of no reputation. Verse 7, and took upon him. Verse 8, he humbled himself. So, there's many different references in God's word about what Jesus did. And references about the glory he had before. Um, before I go any further, this is, a, this is a, it's a deep topic. It's a hard topic. And let's pray before we go any further. Father God, please help me. Uh, Lord, I, I'm a small man, Lord. And I need your help. I need your power. Lord, I would ask that you glorify yourself through me. Use me for your glory. Use me as your servant, Lord, to speak your words. Father, I can't do this alone. Lord, I will confuse it and mess it up. Lord, I need your power and guidance as I speak, as I I follow your word. Lord, thank you for the opportunity. And Lord, I know you're here in this presence, in this congregation listening. Lord, I would ask for your power now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, as we think about what Jesus came, what Jesus gave up to come and die for us. 
We should also think, and this is the caveat at the beginning, when we think of what he gave up, we should think about what we should give up. I think it's, it's logical. It makes sense. He gave up so much. What are we willing to give up for him? I mean, we live our daily lives, go about our daily schedules. Are we willing to give up anything for him? I mean, that's really the question. Do we give up anything for Jesus? Because I'm going to try to go through, using God's word, some of what we can understand of what he gave up to come and die for us. Really, the question is, what is Jesus worth to us? What is he worth to us? I mean, it's a question we got to ask ourselves. The lost in the world that aren't saved, the people that aren't saved, he's not worth much, if anything, because they don't know him as their savior. For a Christian, he's our life. For a Christian, he's our future. He's our help. He's our salvation. He's our eternity, our new body. He's our resurrection from the dead. He is life. If we don't have him, I, I, think, I think you have to say this. As a Christian, if we didn't have Jesus, there'd be no point to living. There's no point to anything. He is everything to us. We read of the martyrs. We read of powerful missionaries in the past, preachers, of great prayer warriors. And one girl I read about, she would pray for 300 missionaries every day in Ireland. And wonderful things came out of that, missionary, that, that ministry. But think about that. 300 missionaries she'd pray for every day. It was a prayer life like that. Powerful martyrs that died, laid their lives down for the gospel, for the truth. We read about those, those testimonies. The Bible tells stories of people that had faith in God and were used in mighty ways of God. Hebrews chapter 11, the, the hall of faith. Most of those people, if not all, gave up something when displaying faith in God. They sacrificed something. There was a sacrifice. Hebrews 11 talks about how Abraham gave up his country. Rahab gave up her city and idols. The martyrs gave up their lives. And Jesus gave up more than I can describe or any of us can comprehend. Now, I'm going to try to go a little bit, just touch on it today. But Jesus gave up more than I could put into words. When we withhold ourselves in our service from God, we should think of what Jesus gave up for us. Really, that's the right perspective of a Christian. It is the right perspective. How can we deny him anything when we start to understand what he gave up for us? What he gave of himself for us? When we feel the need to pray, how can we deny him? When a brother or sister needs help, how, we can, how can we deny him? When service is needed, how can we deny him? And that's the question we need to ask. Remember Jesus. And I want you to leave with this mental picture today. After refusing to do anything for him, after refusing to serve him, after ignoring him or procrastinating to do his work as a Christian, think of him speaking to you face to face, and he says this, I gave myself for you, and you withhold yourself from me. If you do so, you know not the greatness of my love for you. And that's the truth of it. If we withhold ourselves, our service, anything we can give to him, we don't understand his love for us, what he gave. Jesus humbling himself and coming to die for us is directly related to God's love for us. They're intertwined. So let's talk about the condescension of Jesus today. His humbling himself to come and die for us. So that verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the first one we read, it says very specifically one thing he gave up. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, through, that though he was rich, yet for his sakes he became poor. His riches. He gave up his riches. So let me kind of go into a few things about his riches. Just talk about a few things. What riches? What riches did God have? Infinitely more than I can describe, so I can't put into words everything. So I'm going to just touch on a few things. First, Jesus didn't start when he was born. His life didn't begin at birth, when he got a, the incarnation, when he got his human body. Remember, he is eternal and always has been. That's what the Bible teaches. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who was the Word? The Word was Jesus. He is God. He is God. 
Colossians 2, nine. For in him dwelt, this is talking about Jesus, in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's Jesus. There there was never a period in which there was not Christ Jesus our Lord. He is self-existent, hath no beginning of days, neither end of years. He is the immortal, invisible, and only wise God, our Savior. That's Jesus. He was alive prior to our small speck of time in eternity, I don't understand the eons before time began, before our creation, before this world. I don't understand that. But we're just a small speck in eternity. He was, always was. Can my mind understand that? No. We're created, we have a start, we have an end. That's all we understand. God is beyond us, praise the Lord. He's better, higher, more wonderful than what we can understand. Jesus was spirit, as God the Father is a spirit and the Holy Spirit is a spirit. The Holy Ghost is a spirit prior to the incarnation. Have you ever thought about that? What Jesus was prior to the incarnation. There are some mysteries and wonders that we don't really dwell on. I have no idea what he did in the eons and ages and infinity past. I can't even guess at it, and I'm not going to guess at it. I have no idea all the hosts of heaven. I have no idea what wonders and creations God did prior to the creation of earth and man. There's wonders, mysteries that we don't know, things that God's word kind of hints at, but doesn't give us something solid on. And he does that for a reason. We don't need to know it. There's, there are some things we do know, though, or some things we can glean from his word, and that's really what I want to touch on. Jesus gave up his life, and this is one of the riches. He gave up his life in heaven to come to earth. He gave up his life in heaven. John 6, 38 says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Who was him that sent him? That was God the Father. He gave up possessions. Jesus gave up possessions. He owned everything in creation. He's God. When you think about this, the depths of this this is pretty amazing. He's the creator of all. The Bible says it in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's Jesus. You know, all gold, all diamonds, everything precious was his. They say there are, and this is actually switching kind of to modern science here, But they say there are complete planets made of precious stones. Um, NASA and some of these other things that observe space and and use spectrometers and all these things. They say there's complete planets that are made of precious stones. I read one article that talks of planets that rain gemstones. The pressure is so high, the chemicals are just right, that it rains rubies, rains different gemstones. It's an amazing thought, something we couldn't comprehend, we couldn't live in. But it's an amazing thought. God is extremely creative, amazingly creative. You know, NASA has been talking, uh, various other agencies too, they've been talking about trying to mine an asteroid. There's an asteroid out there, it's called 16 Psyche. This asteroid was discovered in 1852. It has enough gold in it to make every single person on earth a billionaire. It's worth 10,000 quintillion. It would, if they mined it, it'd break the world economy. But they're looking at a way to mine it. So this is an asteroid made out of pure gold. He owns everything on this earth, but everything outside of what we don't even understand. He owned that. Being creator was one of the the brightest jewels of his crown, too. The fact that he's creator. Riches proceed from and exist because of him. He makes them. Lifting a finger, he could create a new universe. At the will of his mind, he could have created millions of angels and legions of bright spirits. At his voice, he could create light. He could say, be, and something would exist. This is just some of the material riches that Jesus gave up in heaven to come and and die for us. And I want to say this before I go further. I'm not trying to lower Jesus at all. 
What I want to do is I want to lift him up and show the sacrifice he made for us so that hearts burn for him. Hearts love him. So many hearts are hard, and there's such a weak fire in Christians. He gave up honor that he had in heaven. Not the honor that men receive when they're rich, but honor that the divine majesty received from the hosts of heaven. Sitting on the throne in heaven before creation began. John 17, 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus had glory before creation. And glory also gives a sense of honor, praise, fame, adoration, splendor, magnificence, perfection. God, Jesus was always perfect, but the environment was perfect. In heaven, Christ dwelt existing with worship all around. And he gave that to come and die for us. Gave that up to come and die for us. He gave up the worship of the hosts of heaven. You look in Isaiah chapter 6, 3, and I love this passage. Beautiful passage. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. That's the environment of heaven. Having the angels worship him constantly. Yes, they still worshipped him, but he was here on earth preparing to die for mankind. He gave up that environment of heaven, which we don't know much about, but it was peace, joy, praise, everything good. He gave up unknown glories. And this is the area that I can't really go into, but there are things we don't know, a lot of things we don't know. And that's wonderful. It's good. Our God is above us. We're small. We're just a creation. We don't know about the hosts of heaven, what or who they could be. Yes, they loved him, adored him, worshipped him. We don't have a list of the previous wonders he did. We don't know what was created prior to Genesis 1. Spurgeon said this, and I thought it was interesting, Charles Spurgeon. It was about Christ prior to creation. It says, It may be that on set days, the princes from the far-off realms, the kings, the mighty ones of his boundless realms, came to the court of Christ and brought each his annual revenue. Oh, who can tell but that in the vast eternity, at certain grand eras, the great bell was rung and all the mighty hosts that were created gathered together in solemn review before his throne. Can you imagine to yourselves the sweetness of that harmony that perpetually poured into the ears of Jesus, Messiah, King, eternal, equal with God his Father? No. At the thought of the glory of his kingdom and the riches and majesty of his power, our souls are spent within us. Our words fail. We cannot utter the tithe of his glories. We can't understand what was created before, what the hosts of heaven are. The glory that he left in heaven to come and die for us. We don't understand that completely. And have you thought about this one? And this is such a big one. Have you thought about what it must have been like for God to live in a wicked world? He left peace and joy to come live where there's sin all around. Wickedness and wretchedness all around us. You know, Christians, we, t- we talk among ourselves. We get tired of this world. How wretched it is. The violence, the, the twistedness with morality saying things are are right when they're absolutely wrong, twisting things upside down. We get tired of it. Often it, it, it feels like we have nothing in common with the people of this world. After you get saved, it almost feels like you're an alien or they're an alien, but you have nothing to do with them, nothing in common. Because our hope is in eternity, in heaven, in, in Jesus. Theirs is in Saturday night and the weekend, drinking and all these other things. That's all they have. Ours is in eternity. It's uncomfortable to work sometimes around the, the lost because of the profanity, the cursing. They just, everything is different. When God saves us, he makes us a new creature. We're new. We're made new. What we desire, what we like, what we, who we want to be around is all completely different. It changes. And that's because of what God does in us. 
But think about Jesus. He came from heaven to this wretched world to die for sinners. He's holy and hates sin. Jesus willingly came to the sinful earth and had to deal with sin all around every day. What must it have been like for God to have to endure this world? We get tired of it. What must it have been like for Jesus? Have you thought about that? Why did he give up untold riches? It was for us, that we might be made rich. Next thought. So he gave up riches. He gave up his eternal form to become man. So he was born of a virgin. We have that uh, prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It was prophecy about the coming Messiah, about Jesus being born of a virgin. Many other Bibles will remove that, and they say it's just a young woman. And it becomes no longer a sign, an indication, or even prophecy, because young women have children every day. There's nothing uncommon. And as Pastor would say, it's not, it's not even rare. Rare is something that happens every once in a while. The virgin birth is unique. It happened one time with Jesus being born of a virgin. The Almighty God chose to descend from his throne and be born by a woman. What must it have been like for God to be born by one of his creations? We, don't even, we can't understand that perspective, but I think we could touch on it. God, who created everything, was born of a woman. Just a small creation. Life's hardships. He became a man and dealt with life's hardships. Yes, he's God 100%. But he was also man, 100%. That's called the hypostatic union. That's the theological term. That he was fully God and fully man. Something that we don't understand again. Our mind can't comprehend that. But the Bible teaches it. And it's truth. And remember, God is above us and better than us. He's beyond what we are, small man, small creation. He is the creator. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He made himself a little lower than the angels so that he could taste death for every man. His human eyes could look in the sky and see all the planets he created. To realize that, the perspective Jesus must have had. He can look. He knows what's on every planet. He created them. The hands that set the world in motion became the hands that helped his earthly father and mother. The power in those hands, yet they helped his father and mother. He chose the for man to die for mankind. That's why he did it. It was to die for mankind. Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil. Hebrews 2.16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Why did he do that? He did it because he could die for us. He could be our Savior. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't something that just happened. He chose to do it for our sakes. To suffer death. As a man, he could suffer death. He was God and is God still. He didn't have to die. He chose it for our sakes. He came to show love to the people of this world. He didn't come to be loved. We know he was beloved of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. He already had love. He came to show us mercy and grace. That's another thing that he gave up. So he gave up riches in heaven. He gave up his eternal form to become a man. And he gave up his life. This is the third one. Not only did he come to die for us, but he, would, he knew he would be dying for those he had created. We're small. You know that? We're so small. I know a lot of people have this really puffed up feeling of they're big, they're important, their people should follow them, look at them, how good they are. We are so small and broken. When you start to actually... See who you are according to God's word. We are broken. There is a sin nature in us that causes us to do everything that is destructive. 
and broken. And the Bible talks about a madness within mankind, talking about that, that sin nature. Mankind has a madness in them. And it's true. You can see it. The, the frustration of that, that sinful nature, fighting against that. The lost people in the world, they don't understand that. They think what they do is right and good and they're good enough. It's when God starts breaking through those cracks and showing them you're a sinner that they start to realize how broken they are and how they need God, how they need Jesus. But we're insects and worms. We're small. We're broken. Yet he loved us so much. He gave up his life. God is love. This is what churches everywhere will say. God is love. You can hear that almost any church. God is love. But here's the caveat. He's also holy, and he will judge mankind. That's what many churches won't say. He's love. He'll accept anything. He'll accept whatever you are, whoever you are, he'll accept you as you are. You can just come to him, and that's not true. God's word talks about him being a holy God that will judge sin in righteousness. You know, God's holiness is satisfied in that there will be a judgment for sin. That's his holiness. There will be a judgment. And the Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die and then the judgment. Every person will stand before God. For the lost, this is an impending doom. That's because every person has sinned. Every person is guilty. It's a doom that they should be terrified of. That they should be weeping over. Because this isn't a doom just once you die. This is a torment, an everlasting death. Basically, a death that keeps going forever. And I think you almost got to think of it this way. A lot of Christians will say, I'm not afraid of dying, but of the process of it. The lost person that doesn't have Christ as their Savior, they are forever in the process of it for eternity. Living eternally in death. Horrible, terrifying thought. That's the impending doom because of sin. One sin means guilt before God. Nobody is perfect, nor can we be perfect. An eternal death sentence is hanging over every soul on this earth. But God's love is satisfied in showing his mercy to mankind through Jesus. By giving his son to die for mankind, he showed unexplainable, unimaginable mercy. He showed a mercy that's above anything that we can comprehend. Jesus is the manifest mercy of God. He is the one shining bright hope in this world. If you think about it, could you give your child to die for your enemy? That's what God did. God the Father gave his son to die for his enemies. What if your child was perfect? What if your child never sinned? What if your child always loved and honored you, was adored by all the hosts of heaven? Now, I am talking about God, and we don't have children like that. I don't have children like that. (laughs) And we can't really compare ourselves to God. We can't in any sort of way. But this shows how much more of a sacrifice it was for God the Father to give his son than for us even to give our children to die for somebody. God the Father gave his son to die for us. The love in that and the mercy in that is beyond anything that I can explain from up here. Jesus knew he would be dying for those who hated him. We have scripture that says that. Romans 5, 8 through 10, it says, But God commendeth his love towards us, basically demonstrated his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It says, for when we were enemies, he sent his son to die for us when we were his enemy. And Jesus knew the torment he'd suffer. He knew it. Matthew 26, verse 36 through 39, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. 
And then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He knew the torment he'd go through, the torture. And he prayed that again a second time. Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Yet he submitted to the will of his father. And in love he came and he gave up his life. These things are incredible thoughts. What Jesus gave up, the riches of all of creation, the riches of, of heaven, of that adoration, that honor. He gave up his life. He gave up his eternal form to come and die for us. Jesus humbled himself in a way that we really, we really need to look at and really need to try to... We need to act that way ourselves. We need to be humble. Jesus left his riches and glory in heaven. He had with the Father. He took on him the form of man. He humbled himself and died on the cross for those who were his enemies. Why did he do all this? Why did he do all that? There's got to be a purpose in it. Why would he do all that? And that's in, in the fact that it was for your sake. It was for my sake. He did that because it was for our sakes. He did that for the sinner that's lost in sin. This world is a world filled with sin and iniquity. It's a wickedness. And our country used to be founded on, on Christian principles, on God's word. But it is, everything is speeding up faster and faster, becoming more twisted and upside down and wicked. And Jesus, he came to save the sinners, the people that are out there that hate him. He came and died for those people. And some Christians here were probably those people. We were all his enemies at one point. But some probably directly hated him. He came to die for his enemies. That's an honor. That's an offer of hope. Jesus offers this world hope. Christ offers you the riches of forgiveness and eternal life. Why does he do that? Because the wrath of God rests on on a person that hasn't accepted Jesus as Savior. Because a person has sinned, because they're a sinner, the wrath of God rests on them. They have no hope other than Jesus Christ. Your only hope, your only hope is Jesus. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters the fact that you'll die one day and you'll stand before Jesus. You'll stand before God and you will be judged. That is part of the gospel. The gospel is actually that Jesus came, died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And he did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for sinners. He lives today and is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Jesus didn't just come, live, die, be raised from the dead, and go to heaven, and that's done. That's it. This is the hope. And this is the, such the, the all of it's neat. But this is neat, too. We have eternal life, resurrection in him. We'll receive new bodies and live forever in the presence of God. That I can't describe. Again, it's another area where the Bible talks about him showing his kindness to us for all eternity. What is that? And we know he created all of creation here, the planets, this earth, the things in the earth, mankind. Our God is incredibly creative, He's the designer beyond any designer. What could he do in eternity? What could he make in eternity? I mean, God can do it again. We will be reconciled to God the Father through Jesus the Son if you accept Jesus as your Savior. For a Christian, if he gave up so much, this is for the Christian, that was for the lost. For a Christian, if he gave up so much, how can we give him so little? I mean, every Christian has got to ask that question to themselves. What do I give to God? What do I devote to God? Do I give anything to God? How can we offer so little of ourselves to the one that saved us, that, that came from glory in heaven, came to earth and died for us? So little of our time, so little of our hearts. 
this moment right now, this time that we're in, we're in a, the age of grace where people are being saved, added to the church. We're in that moment in eternity. This is the opportunity for Christians to humble ourselves and give everything we are to God. This is our opportunity to live by faith, act by faith, read God's word, and then act on it and live by it. Someday, we won't have that opportunity because we will look at Jesus. He'll be there in front of us. This is an opportunity. When will Christians be broken and forget the entertainment, the pleasure, the distractions of this present life and start to really focus on God? And I'm, I'm not asking this completely to everybody here, but to myself as well. When will we be broken and finally get to that point where we do something for God? We humble ourselves and offer ourselves completely to God. We have the opportunities, the people here have the opportunities to be exceptional Christians, but that's only by faith God and his working through someone that's submitted to him. We read about those martyrs. We read about those prayer warriors. We read about those preachers and those missionaries. We can be those people. We have that opportunity, but most of the Christians, I think, in the United States will only give just a smidgen of their lives. They'll just give a 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. They won't give their time. They won't give their money. They won't give their possessions. They won't give themselves in their heart. Their heart often is devoted to something else. Distractions, hobbies, weights, living their life for themselves and maybe touching on God here and there. But it's devoted to themselves. And I've noticed that we talk a lot, and I'm throwing myself in all this as I say this. We talk a lot. We say good things to each other. We have good ideas, good intentions, good fellowship between each other. We have good environments to gather in here. This is beautiful. But we get so little done. Why is it that we talk a lot, but we don't do much? We talk... And I think it's because we're so distracted in the United States. There's so many things to let us focus on. This or that or this or that. And we don't submit ourselves to God and give ourselves to him. He humbled himself and gave up so much, yet we're willing to give so little. He humbled himself from indescribable glory. He came to die for us and live for us for eternity. The Bible says he's our great high priest and he will be our great high priest for all eternity. It's so sad that people reject him. Sad that the lost people in this world, they don't see him as valuable. They don't see what he did as something that they need. And that's sad because there will be a day that they die. It will be an unexpected day. And they'll stand before God and they'll be cast into hell for all eternity. Where they will burn in torment. Because they rejected Jesus. That's sad. But it's also so sad that Christians choose to ignore him. They choose to live selfishly. That is, I think that's the modern American Christian, is to live a selfish life for themselves and not to, to surrender to God and give themselves to God. When will we be broken and love God? That's the question I want to ask. When will we, we be broken and look at what God did for us and actually respond and do something for him, surrender to him, actually love him back? That's really it. Do we really love God? That's the question you got to ask. Do we really love God? A lot of people say it, but there's no actions. There's no heart. There's no fire there's no living for God, time spent doing something for God. Nothing. It's utterly empty. Those words are empty. So I'll leave with this, I'll end with this today. If you're lost, repent and be saved. Today is the day of salvation. And if you're a Christian, repent and offer yourself to God. Give yourself to God. Don't just think about it. Don't just talk about it. But actually take that first step. There is a first step. And it's actually doing something. Obeying what God says and stepping out and doing it. 
We have to take that first step today. There are so many people lost around us, so many people dying and going to hell. That's what God's word says, and it's truth. When will we stand up and actually try to reach them? Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, oh Lord, you gave up so much to come and die for us. And Lord, I, I'm a small man, and, and Lord, I know you can use these words today and reach hearts and work in hearts. Father, you are the one that's powerful. You're the one that moves in hearts. And Lord, I, I would ask, Lord, that you work in hearts today. If somebody here is lost and going to hell, Lord, I would ask that you convict them. Show them where they're going. Show them truth. Lord, I pray that you would cause them to fear that. Because it is something worthy of fear. Lord, and for Christians here, Lord, help us have the desire to, to love you and serve you. Not just the thought, not just the talking about it, but Lord, that we would step towards it. Take that first step and offer ourselves and live for you, Lord. Go where you want us to go. Do what you want us to do. Offer ourselves, Lord, in service. We need Christians in this time like that. And Father, Lord, you're a wonderful God. You're a wonderful God that has given us so much, offered us so much, paid, paid the cost, sacrificing your son. Lord, help us understand more the depth of that, that sacrifice. Lord, that we'll love you more. Lord, help us today. In Jesus' name I pray. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, please.